Hey, welcome to the show. I'm Jordan Harbinger. This episode, I've been trying for 12 years to get Darren Brown on this show, and I'm very excited to have him on. What was even better is we went and did this in London in his house, and this place was everything you'd expect from Darren Brown's house. It was like a museum of oddities and rare antiques. There were like two-headed taxidermied animals and six-legged piglets and secret passages and all kinds of cool stuff in there. He even had the model of Bernie from his show, The Push, and it was just everything I expected and more. He's an amazing guy, super cool for letting us do that as well. Today on the show, we talk about what goes into his shows, how he designs the tricks, how susceptible we really are to all this manipulation and persuasion, what's real, so to speak, and what's not in his shows, and a whole lot more. So enjoy this episode here with Darren Brown. And by the way, if you wanna get the worksheets so that you can solidify everything that he teaches here in this episode, go to the website, jordanharbinger.com, go to the show notes for this episode, and the worksheets will be in there. And if you wanna learn how I network and create a circle that includes amazing folks like Darren Brown, go to jordanharbinger.com slash level one. I'm teaching you all my networking secrets, if you will, there for free as well. All right, enjoy this episode with Darren Brown. One of the things that I've liked about your work for a long time, well, first of all, this, this was a pleasure to prepare for because very rarely do I get to watch 20 to 30 hours of magic oh. and illusions yeah. and read a, a good book about happiness and stoicism. Oh, wow, you've done, you've done your research. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and then, of course, go and try things that I tried 10 years ago. I was telling you before the show, with, with the, the, the switch of the painting, and I'll, I'll link to this in the mm. show notes, the, the YouTube video, where people are walking by. I remember trying this in law school, uh, I guess us, us sort of failed, or escape ex-lawyers, escapee ex-lawyers. Oh, you're an, ex you're an ex-lawyer as well? Yeah. Right, right. We're always like, I have a hypothesis that we just went that way because we didn't know what else to do with ourselves and then went, screw it, I can't do this anymore. I think it's exactly correct, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a sort of like, we have what it takes to do something, and yeah. we aim our energy in the wrong place because can't go wrong being a lawyer. Exactly, which is exactly my yeah. Everyone's telling you because here in this country, you choose you're making those decisions. You, you're gonna you can do your A levels when you're 16, 17, around already having an idea of what you're gonna study at university, which of course is only the one your one subject, so that's gonna be law. So at 16, you're choosing the A levels you're gonna do to sort to support that, which means in the level below A levels you're your GCSEs, which are kind of like 14, you're already beginning to think what direction you've got to head in because you're narrowing your subjects down. And it's just ludicrous. By the time, you, yeah. by the time you're actually old enough to know what you want to do, it's, you, it's that thing of always thinking in the future, isn't it? Always thinking these rungs up the ladder as opposed to just, right. you know. Yeah, reading. of course, the, one of the reasons I went was because I didn't know what else to do with my life. Couldn't yeah. get the most basic of retail jobs <laughs> other than maybe selling CDs at uh, Best Buy, which I think here is called like JB Hi-Fi or Virgin Re mm, Tower Records, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought, well, I'm not going to do that with my four-year education. And somebody who doesn't know you from Adam is like, you should be a lawyer. You like arguing. Oh, OK, let me spend $120,000 in three <laughs> more years of my life. You should be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'd fit right in with all these other people everyone hates. So why don't you join them? It, it pays well, from what I hear. Yeah. So it, you never did it? You never, I, you never I, actually... I actually did. I went through past the bar in New York City, went to work on Wall Street, and then went, this is not what I want to do. But I'll only do it for four years. And luckily. Well, my luck, no one else was how lucky. Because you look about 19, how old are yeah, you? 38. 38, yeah. right. Well, yeah, so that's long enough to... Have, Next yeah. month, yeah. Right. Well, I, I, I pass the bar. I go and work there for a couple years. The economy tanks, and I'm doing mortgage-backed securities, which is exactly what no longer works, right? Mm. The subprime mortgage loan pool things. And so they go, hey, look, all you have to find a new job. More, mm. more likely, you know. So I apply to be like a patent lawyer, and they go, "Great, you've got to do all this other stuff." And I went, "Screw this! I just like doing interviews. So I'm going to mm. do these interviews for a little while, and then once I really have to get a real job, then I'll figure it out." And luckily, I'm still waiting for that moment where this all comes crashing down. <laughs> I would imagine that happens with any creative career. You ever wake up and go, "What happens if no nothing works out for me anymore, and I have to start over?" I kind of got. I feel I got a lot of strings to my bow now, so I don't worry about it too much. Because actually, the stuff, the stuff that is least under sort of my control, like a broadcaster going, that's it. We, uh, that's all the stuff I kind of in, sort of enjoy least anyway. The stuff I really do enjoy is just me getting up. Doesn't not necessarily the stuff that earns me money, I suppose, but it, 
probably just kind of enough to tick by, but I enjoy it more, so that's... I kind of don't worry about it too much. Yeah, I suppose at the point at which you're doing a Broadway show coming soon, with any sunny luck, mm. and then net, double Netflix all over the UK, household name, there's a point at which if everything comes crashing down, you're just like, I'm retired, it's over. Yeah, yeah. that would be that would be, uh, that would would be be nice. But I, do, I, still, I don't know whether I'd stop. What would be interesting then is, you know, you realise what you do because you have to and what you... What you feel a bit lost without, you know, I'd, I'd think I'd happily, I'd happily not make TV, but I wouldn't want to not tour, but then if you're going to tour, you kind of need, you need to have the, the right. presence that TV gives you, uh, otherwise no one wants to come and see you on stage, so it's, I don't know, I don't know how it would work, but I'd paint and take pictures right. and write, that'd be mine. How would you describe what you do? Because magician doesn't really, it doesn't seem like that's quite the same thing, you know, when you think magician, you think, pick a card, any card, yeah. oh my gosh, I barely saw that, where's the, where's the coin? <laughs> right, and there's like the, you, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you, what you're doing is kind of like, wait, how did you convince someone to murder that man? Which is <laughs> right, and where's the coin? And right? where's the coin? Well, and both, both. You see, that's that's yeah. I uh, I started off as a hypnotist, so I, when I was at university, I studied law, as we said, right. and I uh, saw a guy do a show, which uh, unusually for a hypnotist wasn't it wasn't a kind of embarrassing, you know, festival of of horrendousness like a lot of stage hypnosis is it was actually it just it was fascinating and hilarious but it was intelligent and it wasn't embarrassing so i left the show that night thinking and saying to my friend i remember i am going to i'm going to do this so that was my first love was learning how to hypnotize so i was a student with lots of other students around me that were really interested in in being hypnotized so i and i was you know just desperate for attention and had that performer thing in me and i was Insecure, and I think hypnosis really taps into a desire to control, obviously, mm -hmm. um, as does as does magic in its own way. So if you don't feel very impressive in yourself, both of those really tick that box. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it kind of became a real a real passion, and then uh, I drifted in more into doing close up magic because it was a bit more commercial. It was a bit an easier thing to to actually make a living out of than hypnosis, where you kind of want certain conditions to work under and so on. And then I, I wrote, I lived, I, I never worked as a lawyer, I was just ticking by performing, and I wrote um, a couple of books for magicians and got known in that world, and I drifted into this psychological type of magic called mentalism. And at the time, I, there, I think there are really only like four or five mentalists around. There's a lot more now. Yeah. Um, probably because of the the shows that I did in the UK, so sure. it became a very popular thing in the UK, and that, I guess that spread out a bit. Um, and, yeah, so I, I, I got signed up by a TV company that spent a couple of years looking for someone that could do that kind of thing. This was back in 99, 2000. The first special went out in 2000 on Channel 4 in Britain. And they repeated the show, and the repeat did quite well, so they commissioned another one. And then, and then and, and that point, it was David Blaine had just become a... It'd been a big thing, and I think we in Britain wanted a, like an answer to that. Mm -hmm. So I think I sort of fit that niche for a bit, and then um, slowly it kind of became its own thing. And I that was two thousand. So it was a while ago. And then I, as I grew up, the the desire to kind of go, hey, look at me, aren't I clever? Mm -hmm. Became less interesting, and and I realised that I think one of the reasons why magic becomes or magicians start off being interesting and then after a while become easily kind of lampooned and, you know, um, fun to make fun of is that it, you're kind of, you are, you're just sort of posturing and people sense that after yeah. a while. So I tried to move, because there is something, there is something interesting about magic, but it isn't, certainly isn't a magician pretending to have special powers. That's right. not interesting. What's interesting to me is that it taps into the, the way we tell ourselves stories about what's real and the way we're constantly editing our, our experience to, to sustain a, a, a narrative for ourselves, which we, we need to, is the only way we can navigate through life. Um, but a, weirdly, a magician is providing a really neat um, sort of example of how that works. You know, if you, you watch a card trick and you go, well, I picked a card and then he never touched the cards and the card mm -hmm. disappeared and it was in my pocket. How did he do that? You've, you probably everything you need to answer that question, you've seen and has happened right in front of you. 
but you've edited those bits out because they didn't seem important at the time. Hmm. And of course, we do this in life, right, all the time. So I've tried to move over the last few years away from that standard remit of look at me, I'm clever, to I take more of a back seat and the 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 stars of the shows, if you like, are the members of the public that are going through normally big Truman show like um psychological experiments where they don't know they're part of a show and they're surrounded by actors and um uh big kind of dramatic like we ended the world for one guy as a yeah, show I did called Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Yeah. So these like quite big high concept things. Um he wakes up in a zombie infested post apocalyptic um <laughs> after we'd spent like months putting cameras in his house, putting fake news feeds into his uh, phone and his TV. We were recording special editions, special episodes of TV shows that he'd watched that would have like news guests on so we could get well-known scientists coming on and talking about a, a meteor strike that was going to happen. So we ended, we ended the world. And, um, but actually it was the whole thing for him was a lesson in valuing what you have. There's an old stoic lesson about um, uh, to, to value what you have and not take it for granted. You, you should rehearse not having those things, sure. you know, so... And you kind of forced him. We sort of to forced do that. that, yeah, forced yeah. that situation on him. But it, you know, it, it it worked. It was it was a lovely, lovely thing. So yeah, this is this, they've sort of grown up with me over the years. So it's a really long waffling answer. No, it's okay. I I loved we'll Apocalypse, get of those. and I'll back up a little because I think mm. a lot of people are going, "What are you talking about? What yeah. we're seeing with like Sacrifice, <clears throat> which is on Netflix, The mm. Push, which is on Netflix, Apocalypse, which will, is on YouTube. Sorry, we're encouraging people to like steal your no, productions please, here. Steal, steal away. These are. Like you said, the Truman Show, if people have seen that movie, this is everything around them is sort of staged and or fake. And yes. so this kid wakes up, he thinks he's going to a concert or something like that with his brother, I guess, wakes mm. up in a fake hospital, mm. zombies all over the place. Some guy picks him up in a van. He's got to rescue this little girl who actually yeah. turns out to be, well, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. he actually has to rescue yeah. this little girl and he sort of finds all these levels of courage that he yeah. previously never had because this is a guy who can't keep a job, sleeps on the couch and goes drinking every night yeah, yeah. and like doesn't what, value What I parents. try and do is find a, find a strong dramatic hook and a, um, excuse me, and a good reason for, for doing it. That's the real message of the show. So Sacrifice, which is the new ones, this, this is on uh, Netflix, it's a bit more uh, accessible, is um, I take a guy who's a very right-wing American guy with strong anti-immigration right. views. As he says, I'm not racist, I just I'm prefer racist, white people or something I, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 I think that's it's actually like, his words. Maybe you should Google what racism uh, is actually defined as. But, yeah, okay. um, and I have him lay down his life for a Mexican illegal immigrant, to take a bullet for, a, for an illegal immigrant in, a, in a, essentially a gun uh, standoff, gunfight. Um, not a gunfight. There's one gun. It's not really right. a fight with one gun, is it? <laughs> yeah. But a, a, a standoff. It's fired um, twice, I believe. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah. Enough. So so that that's 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 the idea. So he's part of this world. He knows that there's some filming happening because he thinks it's part of a documentary. Um, so I'm not completely out of it. Normally, I I I'm not in the show at all because obviously people know me at least in the UK. So this was we had a a, a sort of a half fiction thing where he he. Um, felt he was part of one show that had then finished and was being filmed in England. Then he goes back home. Um, so he's gone. He, the, the change process has happened for him. I, I use these psychological techniques to change him and change his um, feelings about uh, immigrants in, in particular, open up some empathy and, and uh, change that. And then as I, I do this a lot with, with the shows, I, the idea is then, if they felt that, if, if they know they've been part of one show, for the actual final test, there has to be no sense that it's part of a TV show at all. It has to be a real life and a, and a life changing thing for him. So he goes back home, and then a couple of months later, we've staged a thing he doesn't realize. He's, he thinks he's going to see a friend in, um, in Vegas, but gets stuck in LA, outside of LA in the desert. The car breaks down, and um, one thing leads to another, and he's in the middle of this hidden camera elaborate experiment where he has a gun pointed at him yeah. or, you know, he, he has a chance to step up and save a life by laying down his own. Um, and it's extraordinary and they're, they're really emotional um, 
things to go not clearly I mean clearly for the guy these these are huge emotional things but also also for us and for me going through it they're very yeah she spent we spent like a year making these things and you know they're very ambitious and difficult because you have to sustain a whole fiction for the person going through it as well as actually do it um so yes yeah, so I've done a number of these and uh they've taken an interest in illusion and persuasion uh and and just you know good ways of living and, and thinking and that whole business of the stories that we live by and trying to put them to to sort of you know good and entertaining use what are we actually seeing here because i think a lot of people when they think hypnosis they're thinking and i've seen this in, elsewhere mm. in your work where they're carrying the guy outside and he wakes up on the lawn and he's like well how did i get outside and then he walks back in people or that somebody's going to walk around on stage and then cluck like a chicken we don't necessarily think of a subtle psychological manipulation or hypnotic suggestion, which mm. is kind of what's happening with, especially in uh, Sacrifice, where you're playing a jingle and it cues something up. Yeah. It, these sort of suggestions to get people to take certain courses of action, it if you don't know anything about what you're doing, mm. there's probably plenty of people online, and I haven't seen this, but I would imagine there's a lot of people that go, this is just fake, the guy's pretending it's yeah, all staged. Yeah, I've, and I've always had a lot of, a lot of that. Um, I think it's, um, maybe, maybe because it's, it's not necessarily stuff that would work on everybody. So with most of the shows, and it, it varies, but most of the shows, I'm using people that I've selected from a group of applicants. And you see this, this is how the shows start. Here are the applicants, and I've got to choose one. Um, and I'll choose the person that I think is suitable. So in the sacrifice, the guy Phil that we use, I needed somebody um, with these strong views, but also somebody who's suggestible. And, and, and also it's important with him, he's not like a monster racist guy. He's right. actually, although you probably start off not liking him, very quickly you kind of... Uh, you kind of fall in love with the guy, really, as it goes on. I, I felt mean, bad for him initially. He just didn't seem like the sharpest... Like something, he'd obviously gone through something that made him dislike mm. people that weren't white. Yeah, and he said it was his upbringing, but it might have also been maybe he couldn't get a job and he was yeah having a rough time. Yeah, it's an easy scapegoat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, I wanted a kind of everyman figure that we would kind of sort of relate to as well, not just a monster, monster racist guy. Um, so, so maybe that's one reason that. People, I, I totally understand people are skeptical because it is they're, they're quite ambitious things. Um, but if you choose a guy, if you choose somebody that, if you choose the right person, it obviously makes life a lot easier. So I'm not saying the, these techniques that I use would just work on everybody at the drop of a hat. They wouldn't. And I try and explain that throughout the show. Once I've got my guy, um, what I'm generally doing um, is attaching strong emotions to certain triggers. So either overtly with my involvement or completely covertly and just something that happens in the guy's life, normally I'll um, make some event happen that makes him feel something very, like a strong emotion. And then there'll be a sound or a thing that he sees or something that happens in that environment that steals that. It's like, you know, when you break up with a girlfriend and there was some song playing on the radio a lot of the time and you don't hear the song for five years and then you hear it again and it brings back all those feelings right so it's actually a very straightforward sort of conditioning really if you anchoring know. is that what that's yeah, called it's anger in yeah. nlp language it's anchoring okay. or it's conditioning or it's triggering or whatever yeah but it's that that's the idea you're just kind of attaching emotions to um to triggers so again normally with these shows and sacrifice is a good example i want to get somebody into a point where they do something extraordinary and life-changing for them without them knowing that that's what the show's about. So I can never approach it directly. But what I can do is break down, I kind of look at this final thing, like I want him to uh, put his own life on the line and save a life for somebody else who's the last person he'd ever stand up right. for. So I kind of break that down and think, well, what, what are the components of that that are needed? And then, and then normally those things on their own are, uh, can be framed as entirely positive and quite sort of benign things that why wouldn't anybody want a bit more of like mm -hmm. the desire to act and to feel more empathy or be more open or whatever so I, I create situations where those things can be uh, <clears throat> explored and and um, created within him and then I attach them secretly to triggers and then in the end scenario I can 
play or present those triggers at the same time and hopefully with the rush of all those things as they come together and the situation that's being presented in front of him and this sort of opportunity that's that's there uh hopefully he takes the bait that's yeah. kind of that's the idea um and he is you know he is a changed man because of it it's yeah i would imagine he has to rationalize that he did that of his own free will so he couldn't possibly actually dislike yeah, but also he did, he did do it of his own free will. He did, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, with some of the shows, like I did one that was about um, taking actually a very similar structure, but to make people um, hold up a security van and steal like, oh, 100,000 pounds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's called The Heist. Again, it's, it's an older show. So it'll be on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, we'll, we'll put links to all these so that people can oh, watch. Oh, great. Because I, I highly recommend, because sometimes they're hard to find. There's like and, little clips. Or you clips, can't watch them in the US. Like you, fake yeah. ones. Yeah. Th that one was fascinating, the one where they're holding up. Because I just thought... All he, all you did was, uh, well, there was all this prep work, mm. but then the trigger was you're just on the phone with them, and then suddenly, they're walking down this empty street, and they decide to hold up the armored car, yeah. and I thought, but there's like Wait five, a five different triggers that are going off, like this right. color, the color of this, this color has been important. There's a slogan, there's a bit of music that plays in a car that drives past. Um, uh, I use similar techniques with getting somebody to assassinate. Stephen Fry, who's a, I know he's known in the US, he's certainly a huge name uh, here. Um, and the idea was to, the idea was to see whether, so Sahan Sahan, who's still in prison for assassinating, assassinating Bobby Kennedy, uh, always said that he was hypnotized by the CIA. And it's sort of become one of those conspiracy Right, like, things. oh, maybe he was. Yeah, yeah, well, it's just, it's sort of, the, the question for me was, well, regardless of whether he was or wasn't, is it even possible, is it even plausible that the sort of, and he laid out what they did and how they did it. Um, oh, he did? Yeah, yeah, he's got the whole story of how they did it, which is, you know, his story. And, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's also quite a plausible guy, so it was a really enticing premise. Could you do that? Could you have somebody genuinely believe i mean at the last minute it's a blank bullet it's not a real it's not a real bullet it's not obviously not actually going to harm anybody but as far as he's concerned is is assassinating somebody using the same techniques so um wait wasn't he you said he was on stage was the audience in on it the audience were not in on it so they must uh, have freaked out well that was another whole thing that was interesting so yeah so we've basically the guy has gone through again what he thinks is a documentary about hypnosis which allows me to set up some of these triggers without him realizing what they're for because i can openly hypnotize him as part of one tv show he thinks sure. it's part of when actually there's a hidden agenda so the situation arises when he's just gone to an event nothing to do with us um has no idea it's being filmed the audience are not in on it at all uh and stephen fry who's his target is who, uh, stephen is on it and he's, he's wearing squibs and everything so he knows scared he knows this it. may happen yeah um so he's out on stage and then we set off these triggers, and it was a polka dot dress, which uh, Sahan Sahan said was one of the triggers that they used. They conditioned him to feel certain things with a polka dot dress. Uh, there was a, a ringtone that we used. Um, someone's phone went off, and it was a little jingle, little tune that he'd also been conditioned with. Um, and would he do it? Now, he does do it. Not that it's, a, it's a spoiler, but he does do it. But the, it was interesting, because we, so, we had this whole crowd control thing set up because what happens when the 300 right. people in the audience freak stampede out stampede yeah and everyone's running and they out didn't the road. they didn't because there was this thing called normalcy bias which means in these emergency situations you just you sit and you look around no one else is panicking so you don't um and uh and then of course i had the thing of everyone going oh it's fake because why didn't the audience freak out but they they didn't freak out because they don't freak out um there's a there was a story of a pan am flight that um had, it had landed in a foggy runway at night and another plane had taken off over the top of it and ripped the side of this plane off. Oh and there was a period of a few minutes that people could escape before this plane was engulfed in flames. And the only people that did were ones that had either been in a similar situation before or had, had training in this kind of world. Everyone else just sat there and just burnt because they looked around and oh, thought, well, someone will take care of it. It's fine. It's almost but, like a yeah. bystander effect. It's, yeah, it is. It is. It's a... that. It's like if you have an emergency 
you know, there's going to be a flood or there's going to be, you know, you just sort of, oh, it'll be fine. It's not really going to affect me. And right. there's that but natural if, bias towards it, it'll, it'll be fine. If this house was on fire right now and you didn't move, I'd probably be like, oh, it's just one of Darren's, like, things that he's yeah. got in his Yeah, well, a fire alarm is such a great example right. of it, isn't it? A fire alarm goes off. The one thing you know is it isn't a real fire. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the one thing you don't think is right. actually it's a fire. So anyway, so there was, that was, that was an interesting aspect of it. Um, but, so yeah, so that, that's sort of what I do. I, my background is in magic and the sort of mind reading area of magic and over the years I've tried to move into this other area but I also do stage shows so yeah hopefully I should be in Broadway this year I did an yeah. off Broadway show uh, for which we won the Drama Desk Award which is a, a no big a deal thing. no big deal yeah. from, I think it was most unique, uniquest um, stage production. Or something. Unique is one of those words we were like, <laughs> is that a I don't know what the, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the award, award would be, but it was something like that, which was very, uh, which was amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that I did this off Broadway version a couple of years ago, and uh, hopefully, hopefully this year, hopefully in the spring, I should be there doing um, a Broadway version. So that is more of a kind of uh, more traditional kind of stage show yeah. with it. But even then, I try. No, the last show was about uh, faith healing. I, I did faith healing. That before. was awesome. I, I'm this is on Netflix as well. It's called yeah. Miracle. It's, it's it's really good. I'm trying not to be super fanning all over because it's no, hard please, to conduct the. Please do. Yes, yes. Sir. Oh no, let's please fluff my ego. Yeah. That's fine. Um, that was really interesting, and that, that's something I want to ask about more mm. later. But I know you were a Christian until was it your mid twenties? Yeah, Early yeah, 20s? I was until uh, yeah, until sort of yeah, mid university mm -hmm. sort of time. Yeah. When you look at historical healers, old biblical miracle stories and things like that, knowing mm. what you know now about influence, persuasion, mm. psychology, illusions, how much of the stuff, how much are illusions high tech and how much do you think, wait a minute, this, this technology, if you will, was around 3,000 years ago, so this could be fake. This could have been something somebody did to, as a scam and now it's, now it's this lore <laughs> that we base our lives upon. I think, well, I think in terms of, I, I do sort of have people ask sometimes, or do you think the, the miracles in the Bible were just magic tricks? I think it's sort of the wrong question. I think the um, how those stories arrive is more, I think, more to do with how those how those tales get formed after the event, mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, if you're if you're a, uh, a a young Christian community growing up in some other part of the world, and you kind of need your um, you need your backstory to to justify your response to the difficulties that you're facing in your own time so you need your you need your stories and it was very standard in those days to to recreate stories and put words in the mouth of people your, 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 of your figure your guru sure. that had long since died so I think a lot of those stories are really just things that have come out since to, in order to to tell a story or teach a lesson that is useful for those communities, you know, 100, 200, 300 yeah. years later. So I think that's more that the sense. world you're in rather than actually how did he turn the water into wine or, or whatever. Oh, chemistry, um, which they didn't have. But <laughs> they now, didn't have. now it's this, yeah. yeah. No, that makes but sense. I, you hear about like Roman writings then having some quote from like, I don't know, Marcus Aurelius, whatever. And then yeah. it's like, oh, wait a minute. That, now that was said by this prophet. And it's like, well... We have this written over here in this other part of the world, and then it went out through, through Greece, and then suddenly it was yeah. said by this religious guy. Eh. Well, I think I think the uh, the basic. I mean, when you look at the the, the oracle at um, Delphi, that people were you know receiving these amazing messages, and and there may have been all sorts of hallucinogenics involved, but essentially it seemed to be people uh, sort of wanting to believe something and letting information sit and taking ideas that were probably quite general and symbolic and letting them fit the specifics. And that's really no different to what a, you know, medium does today. I mean, it's, I right. think, I think that at its heart, that our capacity for self-deception or at least to, you know, form a narrative that um, serves us from whatever information we're being given, that, that seems to be ages yeah. old and just part of who we are. It, it, it is interesting to see even now something that you would think people have gotten the memo about such as cold reading and psychic yeah. fraud yeah there was a video you did i don't know t 10 plus years ago now where i show i'll show people this because they'll go oh i a friend of mine goes i went to this fair at my university when i was visiting my sister or his alma mater and they had a psychic there and i thought oh what the hell and oh my gosh i think maybe there's something to this and i said let me guess he's an indian guy who's a graphic designer and i said i'll cold read you I, you know i'm not <laughs> psychic here's what i got 
Your parents are disappointed in your choice of occupation. They want you to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a professional. Your mom's really sad, but she's just glad you're happy. She really is more concerned with who you marry. Your dad, however, he wishes that you could have done something a little bit more, quote unquote, respectable. They don't understand the work that goes into your craft. And he's like, whoa, are you psychic? And I'm, I'm like, I'm telling you. I told you, no, you're just yeah. you're just like every other Indian dude in America whose parents are immigrants. Every other graphic designer. Literally, yeah. yeah. You didn't become a doctor or a lawyer. You're, part of your family is disappointed. Your yeah. mom wants you to marry a nice Indian girl, and your dad is kind of annoyed that you didn't become an engineer. The end. Mm. Like, this is universal. And then you get the, uh, I mean, some of the worst things I've seen are sitting in a studio audience. You know, the psychics that come out on a TV show, and sure. they have their audience... And then before they started filming, the, this guy comes out and says, is anybody hoping that someone's going to come through today? And all these hands go up and he just asks people, so who did you lose? How did they die? What was their name? Is there some bit of information that would prove to you that it's genuinely them? And people are just giving this information. Then they start the cameras rolling and he comes out and just says all that stuff straight back. And, it's, and just, it, if you have a dose of scepticism, you're sat there going, this is so transparent. This is... Yeah. But it's, I think because the, the lie is so ugly, it's just so much easier to believe, oh, he must be doing it for real. Because he wouldn't just be asking us what to say and then just saying it just to make us cry because it looks good on camera. Surely he wouldn't just be doing that. Right, you'd have to be like a proper bastard. To... Yeah, it'd have, to be, it'd have to be really nasty. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think it's easier to believe the, uh, the lie because it's, it's sometimes the truth is so ugly. Mm. Having said that, I mean, I, although I, I've spent a lot of my career debunking that stuff, Again, I think the I think it's more interesting. I think the question of oh, are, is psychic are psychic powers real? Are the mediums real? Uh, well, I mean, no. But I think that's not it's not really that interesting. The interesting question to me is, you know, why we why why are the why are the mediums so perennially um, popular? And and you know, what is it about our narratives around death, for example, that? You know, as we've as we've dispensed with superstition so much over the last couple of hundred years, particularly anything morbid, um, and that now you know death is now something that is um, to be you know fought off uh, mm -hmm. at all means. It's, it becomes became the enemy. I mean, our, our system of our system of um, medicine a couple of hundred years ago was still the ancient Greek medicine about you know the humors and the the phlegm and the fire and the yeah. bile and all of that. I mean, it was only fairly recently we've sort of embraced what to us now seems, you know, proper medicine, only really a few hundred years ago. So given that, and given the lack of cultural narrative now around death that provides, would, would provide us with any sort of real meaning, we don't have, we don't have any meanings around death, unlike a lot of cultures that do. So there's, um, so I have, the only, the only real narrative we have in place now is, is the, the, um, the brave battle that someone's fighting. That's a, that's, mm -hmm. that's a sort of a narrative that tends to fit into place, but it doesn't do any good for the poor person that's dying, of course. It makes everybody else, I think, feel better. Sure. But for that, that one person, you're now adding failure to a long list of problems that already exist. So it kind of makes sense that at that one time when actually... Because it is the one time when you need to be most aware of the narrative that you're forming, when you want to take authorship of your story. Because, you know, a book, uh, when a book finishes that last scene, or when a film finishes that last scene, it makes sense of everything that's happened before. And this doesn't happen in life, right? So we have to, it just ends. So we have to really find our own stories at this time that matters most. And it, there's nothing there to help us with that if we don't find it on our own, because those, all those narratives are sort of gone. We don't really respect that anymore. But of course, this opens up a big gap for any tawdry peddler of sure. some semblance of meaning to come along and pack out... Uh, right. We're filling the gap in. Pack out theaters, and you yeah. see the guys like Uri Geller, like outright charlatans that just have no shame whatsoever. That guy must be some kind of sociopath or something. I mean, he just has no qualms about telling people that he's talking with their dead relative or taking money and going, this is where your family member's buried. I don't think he does that. I think he's avoided that. I think it's... Oh, he's avoided and that? And he's very just into positive thinking now. I think. Oh, it's I think, the, uh, I think he's avoided more self-help guy now? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. But certainly there are plenty of people that, that do. And I, but I, in one of my stage shows, I, I, I had... 50 people up on stage and I would do this kind of thing, right? And I was, um, I would do the mediumship and at the same time be debunking it. So I would be giving information that was totally correct. You know, I'd say, I've got your, your grandmother here. Her name's Alice. 
and she's saying, and she's not saying anything, I'm lying to you, you understand right. this, but she's saying that she had a little dog called Teddy and that you used to play with Teddy when you were young. I'm just making this up, but is this true? Yes. Um, so I was sort of trying to keep it in that interesting, mm -hmm. it's fake, it's real. And I, at the uh, really early on in the, in the run, I went out to stage door and, you know, I was talking to people afterwards and signing things. And this girl said to me, can you, can you put me in touch with my dead grandmother? And I said, well, you, you do get from the show that I'm not really doing it. I'm trying to kind of debunk it and show that it's not real. And she said, oh, no, no, yeah, I know. I know it's not real, but could you, could you put me in touch with her? Oh, man. It was fascinating just, just how, first of all, how you can completely hold those two realities right. in yeah. one. And, and, and just what, what that is, just what that a, a, appeal. I mean, I'm, you know, I, don't, I don't believe in any of that, but right. if, when I lost my grandfather, um, shortly afterwards I was talking to a woman who said she was psychic, and when she started to say, oh, no, he's here, he's here in the room now, it's hard to just let that mean nothing and just right. brush over you. I mean, you're either going to get annoyed about it, which actually was my response. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, don't, don't, you know. It's, it's tacky. It's just tacky. Yeah. Um, or you want to, or what does he, what's, what does he say? You know, but it's, it's, um, it's very hard just to let that. Right. Like, I'm, you want it so bad, and then yeah. if there's a 0.001% chance that this is real, like, I'm going to hear this person out, and you just get emotionally invested mm. in the crap that they're feeding you, I guess, at that point. Yeah. And I did a whole, I did a documentary series called Darren Brown Investigates, and I, I would just spend time with people that were making some sort of supernatural claims of some sort, and one of them, one of these guys was a, was a psychic. Um, and I think by any standards, he was fake. I mean, looking back on it, I mean, I, the... We just caught him as close as you can absolutely, I mean, you can't prove a negative, can you? But as close as you can catch someone to cheating, I mean, we just sort of did again and again. Um, so there's really no doubt about it in that sense. But despite the fact that he seemed to be clearly just getting information from here and passing it off as something else, he's still, I think in, this, in a strange way, maybe I'm just being charitable, but sort of still believed it. And if he... He was having people say to him, oh, yes, you must be psychic and you're helping me by saying this. He was sort of helping people in a not So he way. was able to rationalize this in his own mind? Yeah, somehow. it just felt like a strange sort of closed loop that he was in. I thought, well, maybe in a weird way, maybe he is, he is the psychic. He's playing that role. And, and also, why is he letting me in to even film him anyway if he knows, if you know that you're right. just fake, why would you risk... Uh, that sort of, you know, exposure. And it was just, it was interesting just seeing how you, when you get close to it, how it's a very grey, complex area. From the outside, it's an easy yes or no. You know, is it real, is it not? Well, no. But as you get into it, I think it's a very rich, interesting area about, again, how we just, how the stories that we form and what we, what we, what we need to hear. Yeah. I think that, well, you're an amazing performer, but I thought, I think there's a little heroic aspect in a way I'll take it. Of, yeah, of deep, well, of course, right? Of debunking the psychic fraud and the faith healing and things like that. And one of the performances was, you, you train this, I, I think he was like a scuba instructor. Oh, yeah. And you take yeah. him for like six months and you're like, you're going to be a faith healer. And he really looked the part. He had long hair and he yeah. kind of dressed yeah. up and sharply in a suit. Yeah. And then he comes to the United States and he fills, half fills this room because he didn't want to, he didn't want to abuse this publicist to fill the room up massively and he's trying to convince people that he's a faith healer yeah. and then at the end he's kind of like and this is completely fake yeah. and people are just crying because they wanted to believe it and it's it's almost like a, a medical procedure on a child where you're like i hate hurting this kid but i can't leave this yes, tumor it was a, yes it was really back. sensitive it was, a, it was yeah. a tricky it was a tricky thing that was yes that was my first taste of the faith healing so in the last this last stage show which is the one on Netflix called Miracle. I I did it myself because I was I just really got the bug for it by, from training this other guy. So that other show is called Miracles for Sale, um, which was a Channel Four show a few years ago. And yeah, it's just a documentary following this guy. It was it was it was so interesting. I think what the one well, what I learned from doing it myself in the stage show was the it's the psychological component of suffering. So what what I'm doing? I've got a, an audience. So, yeah, cutting forward to the stage show that I did. So an audience that are sceptical, like me, they are not coming to the show thinking there's going to be any healing, which is your biggest um, your biggest weapon, really, as a, as a healer. To, weapons are perhaps the wrong word, but, you know, what makes it work normally is you have an audience of believers. That are already I mean, expecting to yeah, see something. so they're bringing... They're already psychologically prepared for it. 
And I first night I'm going out doing this show, I've got 2,000 people in the audience. I'm thinking, I don't... I, really don't know if this is going to work. I had enough things that I could kind of work mechanically, like the, some of the tricks that they use. So I thought, well, I can, I can get through that section and get to the end and have an ending. But if it doesn't really work much beyond that, then I'll think of something else. But, um, and I just say to the audience, look, I, I know you don't believe in this any more than I do, but just go along. I'm going to play the part. Just go with it, because it's, in, it's, it's interesting. And people did. And then, like, within... And it isn't just... I thought people would come up and they'd say, oh, well, you know, my, my back hurt, and now it doesn't, and there'd be these small improvements. But I had people, you know, slain in the spirit, which is when, you know, you touch them on the head and they collapse out yeah. and they're shaking on the floor and all that this. Just, how does I that had, work? Um, What's going on there? Well, I, I found what did work was showing little clips of... When I'm talking about faith healing, just little clips that would... Um, just show those little scenes like that, and it's just which so they is, kind of know what to do. Yeah, which is of course exactly okay. what happens at the churches anyway, because you're seeing it happen again and again okay. uh, on stage. So you're sort of being educated as an audience member without realizing you're, the suggestion is, is is settling in. But I remember within the first week there was a woman who came up. She'd been paralyzed on one side of her body since she was a kid, and she's in floods of tears. She's forty something, I guess, and can you know move her move her arm, uh, and night after night there were these. It varied, but very often quite dramatic, very physical things. I mean, nothing's changing. Like if you had an x-ray before and after, clearly there's no change. Right. But in that grey area that's more about, again, to repeat myself, the story that they've settled into about their um, ailment. You know, if you wake up every day believing, well, I can't do this because I have this, does that after a while create the problem where maybe... Mm. The physical side might have... Like, I had a bad shoulder for a long time. I still have. And I got so used to putting on my jacket with, like, a bit of a dead arm and pulling pulling the sleeve up with this. I still do that. I don't know if I really need to do that now. And if somebody got me up on stage and said, your shoulder is healed and made a big fuss, I said, now, go on, now put your jacket on and do it normally. And with a bit of adrenaline that's going to kill the pain anyway, I'd, I'd probably be fooled into thinking, mm. oh, my God, you've just healed my shoulder. I've had that for years. So it's that sort of process, but the results were, were extraordinary. And even then I started to think, well, maybe I could do this on a grand scale and I could tell people it's, it's this entirely secular thing and it may not work. It may only work for the 10 minutes you're on stage or it may stay or it may, you know, but that's when you do start to go yeah. mad and get into a whole ethical world of pain because, right. you know. Like, am I doing this for their own good and so it's okay if I'm lying yeah, to them exactly. about this? So how do you not start yeah. to go mad once you've, once you've seen that? But it, God, it was, it was extraordinary and really um, eye-opening and literally eye-opening sometimes, you know, blind things like, sure. again, not, not full, like, you know, organic blindness, but. Um, so it's like if they're kind of, they say, oh, I'm deaf in my left ear, but they're only like maybe 80% <clears> deaf, so now they're convinced they can hear out of that ear. Yeah, there's, oh, there's like lots that. of tricks around that that they use. They, yeah, then you're into the world of sort of um, moving out of the suggestion that makes it work into just tricks. Some of, the me some of the mechanical tricks that I've sort of been put through by healers. There's a lovely one where you see it on YouTube a lot. If you, if you type in um, leg lengthening. Oh, that's the one, yeah. you seen it? The it's, one where they just loosen up the person's shoe. Yeah, that's so like the, the, the effect, most obvious it kind thing. of look, well, it's sort of, I, yeah, again, if you believe it, right. it's such a stupid trick that I think if you, be, you, if you approach it as someone that believes it, you, it looks like someone's, so you're showing, like, here's a guy with a short leg, which is why they limp, and now we're going to lengthen, the Lord's going to lengthen this person's leg, and as you look, this person's leg, I mean, the, the, the heels are sort of in the healer's, palms like this, you see this leg stretch out and then they walk without a limp. And it's one of the oldest tricks in the book. And I have sat on stage and had the guy do it to me. You choose someone with shoes that you can um, loosen. And actually what you do is you, you, everyone's watching this leg lengthen. So you don't do the trick on that leg. You do the trick on the other leg. You, uh, you've pulled, first of all, they don't limp, right? There is right. no problem with the leg. You just say, look, they're limping. Is what they, what they do oh, so me. they just sort of go, well, I didn't see him limp, but he said he was limping. Yeah, so, so he, he must, must have been, be I must have just missed that, but mm -hmm. you think you've seen it. Then they, they hold their feet like this and they pull out one, so the other foot, the other shoe is just pulled off the heel a little bit. So now it does look like if you measure the legs that this, this leg is a little longer, therefore this one's too short. Actually, this leg's fine. This one, you've just pulled the heel off. And then as everyone's watching this foot and you're saying this foot is lengthening, you're just slowly pushing this heel of the shoe 
slowly back onto that foot. But it does look like, if you're watching the other leg, it kind of looked like... Oh, because I'm watching the short leg, yeah, not the you're long watching, leg. Yeah, you're watching the other one. So it's, it, it, uh, it's sort of believable. It, interesting. And then you get them to run around and say, look, no, limping, they can run around fine. And everyone thinks the healing has happened. They could run fine anyway. And I've, I have been brought out the audience and had this done on me by a quite big name healer in Dallas while we're making that documentary show. And the really interesting part of it I left with was it isn't remotely fooling for the person going through it. And just how oddly kind of insulting that is, that you're, you're, you're sort of, there's no sense of it doing any good for that person. It's just about the showmanship. It's just about creating an effect for the audience. You're really kind of, I mean, I wasn't bothered by it, but you're exploiting a potentially very vulnerable person who's there wanting a healing. God knows what's wrong with them. For just that, I mean, it was it was a sort of quite ugly, ugly thing. But yeah, it reminds me of Andy. Ka you know this Andy Kaufman yes, movie? Andy Ka that's and right. He Man goes to the Filipino yeah. or I don't know, like Thailand bush yeah. healer, and he just starts laughing because he's looking down as this guy sort of like scrapes bloody chicken meat yeah. out of his guts, and he's yeah. like, "Oh man." Yeah. Same thing, right? He's he's since it's being done on him. Yes. And he sees it, he just goes. Oh, this is all bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I've, I've done that on stage as well. That's all. That's pulling out the chicken from pulling out, pulling out the uh, bits of. Uh, I used little bits of sponge. It was a bit less gross to do every night. But yeah, otherwise chicken entrails is what is what gets oh my used. Gosh. Yeah, and you're kind of reaching into someone's stomach and pulling the stuff out. And again, not always very convincing mm -hmm. uh, for the person. Yeah, because it's like, oh, I'm not feeling anything. Oh, well, I have a magic spell, so you don't feel the pain. Mm. This is your cancerous. Mm. Yeah. Bad stuff. Yeah. Where do people learn this stuff? There's, uh, there can't be. I haven't looked online, but I assume there's no school for like, hey, you want to become a con artist? Here's a bunch of faith healing tricks. Yeah, that you can well, do at home. And again, do you know the really? For me, the interesting part of it, uh, it's a, it's a it's a strange um, parallel between that and say, you know, the secret, you know, the 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 Ronda, right. If you uh, ma the manifesting thing. Yeah, oh, God, because the the, me whole... the message is, and it's a sort of a faith model, but the message is. Like, you know, throw your pills away. Um, the Lord has healed you. And if, if at any point this illness returns, which of course it's going to, right? right? Um, that's because you didn't have enough faith. Maybe you even thought about taking a pill again. Or what, but either way, it's your fault. It certainly isn't the Lord's fault. And it certainly isn't the healer's fault. It's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. And in The Secret, um, she explicitly says that. It is, it is your fault. You didn't believe enough. You didn't, you know... You know how you're supposed to visualize whatever it is you you want, which is sadly always about money and jewelry. Yeah, and, I want and a her Ferrari. Sister. Yeah, like, like I, I want to be really oh, good. New at... necklace. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then you have to act as if you've already got the thing. You have to totally commit to it, um, which uh, I think is such a damaging. Uh, <laughs> a, it's a, it's the same thing. The problem is it just creates anxiety and a feeling of failure and self blame when, of course that is sometimes not going to work. That model of believe in yourself, ignore all the haters, ignore the haters, ignore the naysayers, believe in yourself, have a vision and stick to it, um, is occasionally a model of success. It's also a perfect model for failure. The trouble is we never read the biographies of the businessmen who just who failed, because you know, we, we don't right. read those. So I think um, it's called survivor bias. Yes. Someone says, yeah. follow your dreams, and it's like, oh, that sounds great. Look, Mark Cuban, sounds I great. mean, or yeah. some of this rich entrepreneur says it. Well, there's a 10,000 other people for each one of them who is at yeah. home in their mom's couch, yeah. like the guy from Apocalypse. Yeah. He's going, I'm following my passion, but I'm just not making any money. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And you don't tend to read. Oh, I got lucky. I got really lucky. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> no, no, we, we see the guy who spent 30,000 hours trying to figure out how to get people to be persuaded by a jingle and a fake news story and a mm. bunch of other psychological triggers. I, how much practice do you think you've had altogether? Like 40,000 hours, 30,000 hours? Have you ever tried oh, to do the God. math on I, this? No, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I started when I was 20 and I'm 47 now. Very soft skin. Nice. Yeah. Um, but uh, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of practice and a lot of uh, trial and error, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I remember having a, a real seminal moment in, um, I had, a, people would come to my rooms as a, when I was a student and I'd hypnotize them. And I remember I, um, I'd leave them, if they were responsive, if they, if they were good, I'd leave them with a suggestion that if they came back and I said, sleep, click my fingers, they'd go straight to sleep. You need that. And, Jen. Uh, Jen needs that. We got jet lag for days. She's gone. She's gone. Sorry. Yeah. That's not a toy. Um, and, uh, 
I had this guy come back, oh, I thought I'd hypnotised before. And I said, okay, sit down, look at me, and sleep. And he went straight out. And then I, we did whatever the hypnosis was. And then afterwards, I realised I'd never met him before. So then I'm thinking, well, how, how did you... So none of the groundwork was no, there. No, none of the right. groundwork was there. So why did he respond to me clicking my fingers and right. saying sleep, which clearly there's nothing magical about doing that. And then I thought, okay, well, it's, it, it was actually just my, my belief and my right. confidence at the time, just, and the fact that he, again, I, luckily he was very suggestible, made that work. Um, so that, things like that just come not from necessarily the hours and hours of, I mean, they do, I guess, but then it's not about technique per se, other mm. than just realisation of, I think all I do is, all everything I do is about, seeing the thing from another person's point of view and just that that's the toolbox that's the that's the toolkit right. is someone else's ongoing um what percentage experience. of the population is that suggestible where you think maybe you can just get them to sleep or, or maybe not quite that suggestible but it probably ties in with people that respond well to placebo it's probably mm -hmm. you're dealing with the same kind of you know in the venn diagram of mm -hmm. those things it's but probably about 30 percent maybe something like that okay but like when that's i'm doing a lot. It's still a lot, well, it, but then it depends what you want. So when I'm doing my stage shows and I've got a couple of thousand people, like with the, with the faith healing that I was doing, um, you know, I might get 300 people come forward from an audience of, say, say 3,000, and then I might get, like, the best 10 up. So now you're dealing with such a small yeah. percentage anyway. They're always go that's always going to be... An ex that 1% in a room is always going to be kind of extraordinary, isn't it? So... That helps. That kind of thing helps. It doesn't mean it, it might feel like the whole audience is responding to something, whereas the reality is you're, you're whittling down to the to the best. So you can create the illusion of it being more successful right, than it is. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What are you looking for with these suggestible people? Yeah, like in in the push, for example, you test them. Hey, who stands up and sits down when they hear the bell? And yeah, you see this on yeah. the Netflix. But are there things where are you ever just walking down the street and you see somebody and you go, "Oh, this person has these nonverbal characteristics of a highly suggestible type of person." Is that does that exist? I've I've done it for a long time and I I've given up trying to do that because I don't I'm always surprised by uh I mean you know openness and a natural tendency to sort of go along with ideas and so on feels like it should be a good signifier of suggestibility and a lot of the time it is but I know how I am socially with people I probably seem like that because I'm not a very good hypnotic subject um but I probably am quite responsive to maybe things like placebo or things like, um, I don't know, just an expert that I admire telling me stuff that I'm going to absorb and take on as my own, which is another form of suggestibility. Um, but I'm not very responsive to a hypnotist hypnotising me. I think something in my ego sort of maybe, blocks yeah. that. And likewise, people that seem very standoffish and, and um, seem very kind of, you know, detached, arms folded, like the last person you'd think would respond, sometimes that all comes from an oddly insecure place. And if you get them into the right sort of type of interaction that hypnosis is, they suddenly become hyper-responsive. So yeah. I've, I've given up, I've given up um, trying to predict it. I, I do it in situations where I can throw it out over a large number of people and, and work with the ones that Right, and look for the respond right responses. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah. How do you come up with some of the tricks or the illusions? I'm, I, you just kind of like, you're walking through the mall with your partner and you're like, you know, what if I made something like that come to life and then vanish? That would be pretty cool, <laughs> right? No, I don't know. I maybe, no, I, I normally have a two week period where, or say with the stage shows, it's like a, a, maybe a month. With the TV show, it's maybe a couple of weeks where I've got to think of a, an idea. So with the TV, it's nothing to do with like, magic effects of any sort it, it's something like what well, can we like in the push for example um uh which is another another one on netflix we were thinking about coming up with all ideas for sort of plots for one of these things to put somebody through and then out of a sort of frustration it's oh can't we just it's a big party everyone's an actor apart from one person and can we make that one person throw someone off a roof you know just so sometimes out of a right oh can't we just blur there's an idea that's like, oh, actually, that's quite, yeah. that's quite cool. So now it's an exercise in social compliance. So the first thing they're asked, so they're helping out at the party. The first thing they're asked to do is to mislabel um, meat-filled sausage rolls as vegetarian sausage rolls. So they, they, they like, there's that little bit of uh, kind of, um, you know, you get, you get your foot in the door with a little thing they're asked to do, and then bit by bit, could you build that yeah. to the point that they would actually 
kill somebody because they're told to. So that that became that became the show. So it's 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 that really. It's it's trying to come up with a um, a fun a fun strong hook, and then make sure that the the, the show's kind of got a good reason, you know, and a good message. And actually, the show on social compliance, that one, the push, went out in Britain a few years. I was quite uh, 2000. I don't know, 16 or something. But some over the last few years, that idea of like good people doing bad things and how we can get persuaded by these narratives that we buy into has sort of become more relevant. So it sort of became, um, uh, it was, it was, it was it became a different show somehow when it, when it was put on, the push was put is, on Netflix. The push is probably my, one of my favorites, if not my absolute oh, favorite, nice. because of the social compliance aspect. Yeah. And because when you watch that, unless you are really good at, rationalizing things to yourself. Even even I, who I know at a certain extent what you're doing with the little vegetarian flags or like getting people to sort of dig a little deeper into the lie that they're telling. Yeah. Unless you are really, really in denial, I think all of us can watch that and go, shoot, I could have probably done up to this point. Like, oh, I wouldn't yeah. have killed the guy, but yeah, you know, yeah. I would have given the speech about how <laughs> I'm the donor, or I probably would have like not have hidden the body, or I wouldn't have kicked the dead guy, but I, but would I, would I have kicked the dead guy? I mean, he's I dead, know, and I didn't yeah. think anyone was watching. Well, I, I, through most of my career, I've had people say to me, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this, or I'd have done that, but I wouldn't have done that bit. Right. And I think what's, what's interesting to me is how our, we think about what we would do with this sense of a self that we have, which we think of in isolation. We think of ourselves, and again, this is this is an, an enlightenment idea that's stuck around, that we are sort of these, um, se- that we should be these separate entities that are not being influenced by right. other people around us, that we should be, you know, or that I'm Separate too smart for this. I'm too. Yeah. This wouldn't work on me. I'm too smart. I'm too principled. Mm. I'm too insert good positive quality here. Yeah. This guy would never be able to fool me. And, that, and of course, that, that that idea of the self like that was born at a time when it was important not to be influenced too much by the church or the mm-hmm. king. There was actually a, making a statement of saying, look, we are, we yeah. should be free individuals is important. But we've bought so much into that idea that we miss that actually the self. I think is a, is a is a verb. I think we self, you know, it's something that's very active and it expands out fluidly into our environment and into our relationships. And, and it's very hard to make judgments about what you would do in a situation when you're not in that situation. And that that's even something that extreme as murder. Uh, you, it's, it, you just can't judge and you can't judge from a distance and say, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because you're making that decision in isolation mm-hmm. and it's totally different. And that's yeah. when you, when you're there. And to me, that is, it's fascinating because it's, I mean, the show's, it's, it's a funny and it's a bit like sort of weekend at Bernie's. That was the kind of inspiration yeah. from it. Um, and the, the guy's called Bernie, the character that dies in it. Oh, that's um, right. Yeah. I never caught that. There you go. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, but, but actually at its heart was, I think to me is it's that thing of what, it, Yes, the social, the, the how far can compliance go, but also what, what our sense of self is and how that drastically changes from context to, to context. How do you test this kind of stuff? Because I'm, I'm imagining, you know, how do you test whether someone's going to rob an armored car? You can't really. No. Right? No, I you... mean, the whole thing could just end up not working. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So then, then well, there's different ways of doing it. So in some shows... We can be following four or five people. Yeah. So it so isn't just hoping that yeah, one. Yeah, it just doesn't need to works. work on all of them because either right. way you've got you know that's your result. If it worked on one out of five, it worked on one out of five. Um, in a show like um, Sacrifice, which is the the current one, um, if he doesn't do the thing at the end, I mean, there's no going back and doing it again. You right. can't say we're going to retake that. Um, so you'd have to find a way of letting that failure sit within a narrative that would then maybe continue and find a another way of going or a way of finishing that would still leave you with a satisfying ending um so yeah. i that's that's the joy of tv it's not it's not changing what happened but you can you can let what happened sit within a story that can of course you know continue and and you can be truthful but still make the story satisfying so fa- failure is important and there are failures within that show sacrifice that are, are part of it and they sit they sit fine within it i think it's it's a bit like a juggler dropping a ball actually occasionally it, it's 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 um 
good to be reminded these things aren't aren't just going to happen. Look through at the some guy. Kind of the magic. guy didn't want to jump off into the rock. Cool yeah, exactly. Yeah, that yeah. And, and that's a, that's all right. That failure. But like, if he was like, I'm not taking a bullet for that guy. Shoot him. Shoot him, Kip. You know. Then he was like, <laughs> uh, now, now, what do we do with the production where he just looks terrible? But it would have been. I, I mean. It would have been amazing to watch that and see it fail, and then you'd be like, "Fuck! What are they going to do? Right. How are they going to get out of it?" Or something. And then, so that's that's still an interesting, dramatically interesting place. Is that up to us to yeah. make sure that it? We do do something interesting. I'm always with that nervous for you when I yeah. see that, though, because I'm imagining you're in this control room going, "Just shoot them oh, and then yeah. jump in there, please." Yeah. You know, I've got to go to the bathroom. I'm hungry. Yeah. I've been in yeah. this <laughs> desert shithole town for like three weeks filming this. <laughs> Just shoot them and get it over with, man. <laughs> Shoot him before I shoot myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shoot him or give me the gun. Yeah, exactly. Have you had ever had any close calls where it's like someone almost blows it? Like they're setting something up and the guy gets home from work early and you're like, don't leave the shed. Oh, we've had... Um, God, don't leave the shed. There was actually in one of the shows... In Apocalypse, so this is the end of the world one. The zombie one, yeah. So, yeah, so we had... Um, it's just, just It's just a glimpse of like how much work goes into these shows. So we had... We'd recorded a special episode of a TV show that he watched. Oh, no, no, it wasn't that. It was the electrical interference from the meteors. So we were we were taking things out of his car that he, so he, the car, this car wouldn't right, start car and the phone, his phone would die and the TV suddenly just died, right, in, as they're watching it. And it's all being explained by, there's been warnings on the radio about you know, electrical interference. So to make that happen, we got two guys in the shed in the garden. Uh, I don't know why we had two, but we did, who were gonna pull the, uh, just the, the cable. Um, but they couldn't then leave this little garden shed to go because the room that he's watching TV in backs onto the back garden, oh, so he man. might see them. His bedroom does the same. So they had to sleep. These two guys had to sleep in this shed. This is after like three months without a day oh, off anyway because the sheer level of work on these is just enormous. Um, for this one little moment that no one really remembers from the show, it's not right. a great part of the drama, it's just a, a, a you know fun little bit. Um, so, yeah, it does happen. But the, the other thing is, which as sort of, I've realized over the years of making them, that we're all a lot more nervous about the fiction being rumbled than we need to be. Because if you were, in a, if you were having dinner with Jen here, perhaps in a, in a fashionable London restaurant, mm -hmm. and you spotted a camera behind uh, a curtain, you wouldn't think, Okay, all right, this whole thing is fake. All these people are actors. I'm on a I'm TV part show. Of some Where's TV? Darren yeah. Brown? I would be excited if I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, yeah. there's, there's, there's a weird... Oh, camera. somebody left a camera here. Yeah, That's exactly, a weird... Exactly. That's so going to get stolen. We've had a couple of near misses like that mm. that we've all been, you know... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like that about, oh, and man. actually hasn't. hasn't <laughs> I love that. that. I've never seen that expression, but I know exactly, exactly. what that means. Yeah. I am definitely going to use that. For those of you who couldn't see that, it's it's this. It's quite simply that. Yes, I spent a lot of my career like that. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't, I can't believe I have. Where what have I done my whole life not having this exact no, hand gesture? No, you haven't. To to symbolize that's oh, couldn't be more perfect. Yeah, because I'm, I'm imagining and imagining those two guys in the shed going, you know. I think I'm going to apply to that job, that office job, after all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Freezing yeah. their ass off in the shed in the middle of winter. And yeah, that was a tough, it was a tough job for everyone, that. Because, yeah, it's eight months and there's never enough budget for yeah. these things. So there's just, you just, everyone's living it. And God, yeah. Who writes all the dialogue? Because for people to really understand this, it very much is the Truman Show. Like, there's a fake charity the, in the push. There's a fake charity gala. Mm. There's a security team for the gala. There's mm. a catering team for the gala. There's mm. all these gifts. There's all these people attending. There's mm. car service. There's the assistant and there's yeah. performers or whatever and, and the hotel, yeah. everybody's in on that. You can't have people wandering in that aren't part of it. No. Well, that's where a production all. team is really helpful. But right? they have to be like secret production yeah. team. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and the other thing is like, you're putting somebody through something quite, uh, potentially quite dark, even if the end result is a positive one, less so in the push, it was all quite dark. So you, you've got to make sure that they're robust enough psychologically. Mm. So there's a whole vetting procedure that has to happen with those people as well. But again, they can't know that they're, normally they're told they're not being used. You know, so they apply to be part of the show, then they're told, sorry, we're not going to mm. use you. And then month, by that point, they've signed. <laughs> they find the thing that lets us use them, and then months later, it'll happen. So you have to vet them. So they have to go through a sort of independent psychological procedures with, with, a, with a psychologist to make sure they're robust enough. Because if they're going to like witness a car crash, for example, oh, yeah. you can't have them having witness a traumatic car crash when they were younger, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> you've got a psychiatrist who knows, or a psychologist who knows the uh, the plot, but 
it's, you've got to, they have to do that, but also believe that everybody else is doing that because otherwise it would tip to them that they're being used for it. You know, so there's totally out of things that you never even see in the show, but just the level of work yeah. that has to exist around it to make sure that it, and all the people that like, you've got to have that person's wife or girlfriend or boyfriend, or whatever involved to make sure that they actually go to this event that we've staged. What if they change their mind at the last right. minute? Like, I'm not feeling, I kind of have a headache. I'm going to bail on this. Yeah. Why don't you go instead? Yeah, just uh, bring the check. So much. Yeah. Oh man. I, it reminds me of a surprise birthday party I had in Germany in like 1998. And I wasn't going to go out that night. And I told my, my friend Peggy, who'd set the whole thing up. I said, I didn't really want to come out tonight. What were you going to do if I was like, yeah. nah, I got a headache. And she's like, yeah, we thought about that because, you know, I'm Mr. I don't want to go out tonight. Like back yeah, then I was like, yeah. oh, it's far. I don't want to get on the bus. It's cold. She's like, we had I've got to go all the way to Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had this elaborate plan of her coming over and being like, she had a whole big idea. She was going to like, she said the idea that was in her back pocket was she was going to tell me that her friend and her wanted to like give me some sort of special Birthday present, if you will. And I was like, yeah, that would have worked. Keep it that, close to yeah. the truth. Close to the truth yeah. is always uh, always good, isn't it? But yeah. I would have been really disappointed if all I got was this surprise. Yeah, party. <laughs> yeah, great. And where's my, sorry, there was a present. Oh, that, yeah. oh, that was fake? I'm, I'm going back home now. <laughs> you, you often show that people are being primed to pick the giraffe or to uh, draw something. How much of it, and then you say, well, look, here's how we primed them. This mm. display, this billboard had a giraffe on it, and this kid's T-shirt had a giraffe mm. on it. And then when yeah. they were on the bus, there was the word giraffe was written on the window. Is that the real explanation, or is that like, oh, crap, we did this trick, and now we got to show the audience why this person <laughs> did this? It's um, it, it really varies. I mean, these, this the sort of stuff that I used to do years ago and haven't done for a long time now, but I, in the same way that when Penn and Teller would reveal a trick, they'd, it wasn't just a witless reveal or here's how we did it. You'd show the method when the method was more interesting actually than the, than the trick. So right. what you go away with is, oh, it was amazing. They showed how it was done and it was really clever and it was probably more clever than, than um, how, you, how you have to do that mm -hmm. trick because the, the overall effect that you want to communicate is the joy of watching how it's done. So that was sort of the approach that I took as well with those things. So they're a mixture of um, kind of real or sort of tweaked i'd say certainly theatrically kind of tweaked mm -hmm. because ultimately that's the bit that you know that's going to be the um the really fun part is seeing how it was uh, how it was done um and also you can only really show the stuff that's sort of visual because it's like that's you're watching it on tv and some of the right. stuff is is um when you're trying to tell a story very neatly of how you did it doesn't always lend itself to those you know that kind of clear visual narrative so there's yeah, it's sort of a, a, a mix, but I kind of figured I had license to approach it with the same kind of uh, sense of theatre as the as the trick itself. I, th I think you have to, right? Because yeah. if, if the answer is, oh, well, that's just a guy with my same build and a mask, it's like, oh. But yeah. if it's like, no, this group of kids had the T-shirt, and then mm. there's the sign on the pub, and yeah. then as they were driving, they saw three billboards, and they've been here all week driving back and forth, so it's been repeated in their brain. Yeah, so, of course, yeah. they picked... It's just like the principles are sound enough yeah. that they would theoretically have worked. So that's a better explanation than, well, actually, they picked a bunch of other things and this giraffe happened to be like the most convenient item for them to pick up at the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, can, it can be a mixture. It can be a mixture. I think, I think it's, um, that's part of, the, part of the fun of it for me, particularly with that early stuff was kind of, you know, some of it's real, some of it isn't. And what, where's the, because um, my background is, you know, hypnosis, suggestion, all that stuff that's, real in whatever real means but that's real that's not mm -hmm. like people sort of playing along or it's, it is what it is and then and then the magic side the conjuring side the you know trickster side where, where you're going for an effect and you know you're going for the um an illusion so everything was sort of sitting somewhere in both of those worlds and i think i think that's sort of what made it fun I yeah hope, i hope yeah. I, I like the idea of that is it perception without awareness perception without awareness yeah, yeah pwa is yeah. there something that we can do should we even think about this? Are, is there think, something that we can do to counteract that? Because it seems a little dangerous. If we're so easily influenced mm. by these things, should we strive to maybe pay attention to that? Because it, not everybody's doing it and then goes, see, now your life is really happy. Now you value your family more because of this fake zombie apocalypse. There's going to be plenty of other people that go, now we're doing this horrible thing as a country because we were all convinced that 
Mm. It's the Jews. Or like, mm. now we're doing this horrible thing to this because it makes us all money. Forget it. Like, it, it's scary to think that we're so easily influenced and we don't understand it. Yeah. And we're not able to counteract it. Yeah. Are there, is there kind of like a self-defense for this? I think there's no obvious self-defense. I think a lot of those things that happen sort of environmentally, those kind of influences and things that are going on that we don't realize are influencing us have their parallels within us psychologically. You know, we, Carl Jung said that the, the greatest burden a child has to bear is the unlived life of its parents, yeah, right? That's so what you, I worry about with my kids. <laughs> with your parents. It. I'm like, they're going to have every... <laughs> uh, welcome. I've got a lot of insecurities. Get, get yeah. a notebook. Yeah, you so, so that, that, yeah, that's your starting point. And then you, you, you know, from an early age, we develop these templates of what relationships should be, what love is, what are, who we are in relation to this world. You know, we get essentially the message, you're, you're small and weak and the world is big and strong. And, and, and this is all a kind of priming, isn't it? It's, it's the same thing that happens environmentally. And then you, you grow up and all of that feeds into... Well, your relationships, most obviously, what you demand from your partner, what you project onto them, the things that you try and hide from yourself, mm -hmm. and they, those things always come back and bite you in some way. Your, your, the things you overcompensate for, become addicted to. You know, this is, it's happening all the time within us, and the best we can do is try and be more conscious of those things that are essentially unconscious, because only, they only own you when they're unconscious. And the moment you have some sort of conscious appreciation of them, they, you know, they lose some of that power. Um, and I think that's the best that we can do. And we can only do that within ourselves. We can only work on ourselves and do the best you know, we can. So I think there's a parallel there. I think it's just... Uh, and, you, and you can never entirely... That Jungian path of uh, individuation, as he called it, you, you, know, you, you can never, you never quite get to the end when you've become the self that you're really truly supposed to be outside of all these influences. You... It's only a journey, and I think that's the best we can hope for in that parallel example of, of what's going on environmentally. If we have all these influences around us and we have hypnosis that is not fake, right? Yeah. It's, it's realistic, and we're creating compliance in people. At what point do we decide that humans and our level of free will is maybe a lot more limited than... than we, like, do you believe in free will? It's a sort of more philosophical concept, I think. But I... Okay, I, I think in life, what we, I think a big part of growing up is realizing that things in life are ambivalent and they are ambiguous and they're complex and they're messy and they're active. They're, things like happiness, we reduce to nouns and the, when we do that, they suddenly become neat things that we can put in the box and they're not. Happiness is really, it's, a, it's an active, it's a messy verb thing. Um, and likewise, we love and hate things at the same time. We uh, things are right and wrong, and uh, hard as it is to accept, left and right are both doing a valid and important thing. The right wing world is protecting the group, and the left wing world is protecting the individual. And we do actually need both of those things in some form or another. So, life's complex and ambiguous, and I think where simple yes and no's and simple right and wrong's exist, then the, the point is those, both of those things need to exist. So my answer to the free will thing is I think both, I think I'm very happy to let both sit. I think in some ways, of course, you can argue that everything is caused by the previous things that makes no sense to talk about free will. Um, but then the trouble with that is that it's almost too easy. You go, okay, right, then it makes no sense to talk about free will. So then it, why bother? doing anything or trying to change anything about yourself or trying to gain any mastery over anything, uh, least of all yourself. So I think then it also makes sense to talk about it as if it is real. And I think um, they're just two models for understanding the same thing. I don't think it, I just don't think it quite makes any sense to go yes or no and then, end, and then end it there. I just don't think it's useful. I don't think it's a reflection of how we, of how we live. Um, the danger is, of course, with that approach, you just end up agreeing with everything. But I, I think I think it's reflects more the reality. Is there a way to use some of these, some of the mentalism for either personal growth or I think self defense was one of the uses. In in the heist, there was the guy gets caught shoplifting. Yes, and he says something yeah, like, this happened to me. The yeah. wall around my house is not four foot high. Yeah. And the guy's like, whatever, yeah, man. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, okay, that's a good example of it. This, this actually happened to me in real life. I wasn't shoplifting, but I was... Huh, sure you weren't. Um, <laughs> just borrowing it. Just borrowing. I was uh, walking from one hotel to another quite late at night. It was, I was at a magic convention in Wales. I was wearing a three-piece velvet suit. Because why not? Because why not? And I, I mean, short of having punched me hard in the, <laughs> in the throat... Tattooed across my face. I, uh, I was, yeah, look, clearly looking to be fought. Um, and uh, so this guy is, you know, he's really drunk and he's uh, clearly, yeah, looking for a fight. And he is with his girlfriend and it's all his adrenaline's kind of, you know, up here. And he starts shouting at me and says something like, what are you looking at? Or what's your problem or something? Um, so I... And again, my, my only toolkit is just the other person's experience. That's really all I can work with. So I said to him, because in that situation, you can't respond with, oh, I'm not looking at anything because then you're on the back foot and they've got power. Or, yeah, I'm looking at you. What's your problem? Because I, either right. way, you're, you're going to get hit probably, right? You're yeah. sort of, you're furthering that dynamic that yeah. they've set up. But you can just n not play that game right from the outset. So I said, the wall outside my house isn't four foot high. This is where this phrase came from, because I said it on that time, that, that occasion. Uh, so it makes sense as a statement. It makes no sense within that context. Right. So he now feels he's missed something. So now he's on the back foot. So his reaction to that is a, a bit of a pause. He's like, what? And I said, oh, the wall outside my house isn't, isn't four foot high. When I lived in Spain, the walls there were quite high. But here, they're tiny. I mean, they're nothing. So, <laughs> so he then... Uh, and I think there's a martial arts technique, which is a, an adrenaline dump, a similar thing, I think, where you, before you strike, you have somebody, you make somebody relax. You essentially take them off guard. Um, so this is what happened to him. All his adrenaline just kind of dumped. Uh, he, he, he went, I, I, I was hoping to just basically confuse him right. and then stick his feet to the floor or do something more overtly hypnotic because that confusion state renders us very suggestible. But what actually happened was... He just went, oh, fuck, and started crying. His girlfriend walked off, and he sat down by the side of the road. I sat down next to him and started asking about what had gone wrong that night. I think his girlfriend had bottled somebody. There'd been oh, some wow. fight, and weirdly that I'm giving, <laughs> giving him advice. Yeah. Um, but it, was, uh, it only happened because I'd been talking about what to do in those sort of situations at Q&A things that I'd been doing after hypnosis shows, and... I'd sort of, so the only reason why it was in my head and ready to go to, to play it like that was because I'd sort of spoken about it theoretically. But so the idea is have, I mean, it can be a song lyric. It can be, uh, it's just not playing that game that the other person is setting up and making them feel that they've missed something. And then the dynamics completely changed immediately. If they're running at you with a knife, all right, there's not much room for this kind right. of thing. But, you know, it's like if you're on a train and you want to keep the seat next to you free. Don't put your bag there because that's what everybody else does. So right. they know what you're doing and they're going to get annoyed. Um, pat the seat, nod and smile at people as they walk. But no one's, no one's going to want to sit, sit next here. to you. Sit here. Just unbutton yeah. your shirt while <laughs> yeah. you do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm ready. Have a seat. So, yeah, so that, that, was, that ended up being my sort of self-defense technique was um, have a song lyric or something. Or uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about this thing and he, um, he's an artist and he used to walk home from his studio late at night through a rough bit of London and there were always these kind of like gangs on one side of the road. So he'd always cross over away from them. And then, of course, they'd always see that. And it was always this horrible, uncomfortable, intimidating thing. Um, so we spoke about it. And then the next night, um, he crossed over the road to them and uh, said, good evening, as he walked past them. And of course, they left him alone because he just seemed like a strange... Yeah, I don't you know, touch the... He's crazy. He's just, he's just weird. Yeah. Um, good evening. So, yeah. Who wants to see a magic trick? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no thanks, man. Get away from us. Yeah. What do your parents think about your career choice? Like, I'm, I'm imagining yeah. they're watching your show and they're like, the audience is ooing and eyeing and they're like, oh, you think that's a surprise? Our son, the religious Christian you boy. You picked up is, his pants. He's a, yeah. He's, yeah he's, he's a gay atheist now. If you want a surprise, <laughs> that was a surprise. Gay -theist. Gay -theist. I'm, cla I'm claiming gay theist now. You should that. trademark that. Um, they seem, oh, they seem proud and happy my neither parent went to university or anything like okay. that so I think when I came home and went I'm not going to be a uh, well, I actually had this conversation I'm not going to be an international lawyer so I was doing law in German um, I'm going to be a magician my mum said oh great that sounds lovely 
In fact, she was so okay with it that I thought, ah, okay, maybe I need to rethink that. Maybe that's a bit of a rash decision on my part. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it all, it all worked out. That's where the persuasion comes from, right? Like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. What'd you tell him when you said he was going to become a magician? I told him it was a great that's idea. Great. He's never going to do it now. Yeah. 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 But I, as it turned out, I did. But um, yeah, that's, that was, they always had a very um, relaxed approach. I wrote them a letter in my first year at university because I was with all these law students that were feeling terrible they weren't going to pass their exams, mm -hmm. not for themselves, but what their parents might think. And I'd never experienced that. So I wrote them a letter saying, thank you so much. I realized that you just let me do what made me happy, which I just presumed everybody did. And I see now that isn't, that isn't the case. So do you thank think you. you'll have kids at some point? Is that in the cards for you? Oh, I don't know. We've been talking about that. I've, I've, um, so I'm 47, as I said, and I, I'm, I find myself very caught between that uh, you know how Nietzsche spoke about become who you are. So there's that, what I think of as a vertical sense of like, this is my life and I need to be doing that and everything else needs mm -hmm. to clear out the way and it's all quite selfish, but there's that urge which doesn't sit well with taking on other responsibilities. Like I've got two dogs and that's kind of enough of, a, of an affront to that urge. And then the other urge, which is the sort of leveling vertical urge of, well, maybe that sense of self becoming who you are is already in the relationships that you have and these things that are maybe that's who I am and you know uh so I'm I, I'm of an age where I'm which I think is partly what middle age is about isn't it when you kind of get a bit caught between that your ego yeah. has your ego has to step down that's the again Jungian terms you've slain the dragon in the first half of your life and now you have to rescue the princess you have to second half of life I think is about serving something else finding the thing that's bigger than you uh and finding meaning in that, I think it's quite, which kids naturally will sort of do. I just haven't uh, quite made my peace fully with that idea. So I'm, I, at the moment, uh, no, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a, dis yeah. it's a discussion, but I'm still, there's so many things that I just do and demand my time that yeah. I, I don't know. And you've got all this whiskey out there. Yeah, and I've got a lot of whiskey to drink yeah. as well. Which isn't yeah. <laughs> isn't compatible with having children. Not necessarily, no. Although kids. The are reason why they're here, by the way, is I actually don't drink that much. Otherwise, they would all be all be that gone just before I pass myself off as an alcoholic. Right. Yeah. 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 You might have to. That would be a different. <laughs> th there's a whole lot of whiskey in here. People can't see it, but we'll maybe we'll do some B-roll of your whiskey. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for using your platform as well to help people because a lot of TV is, I mean, to say the least, it doesn't help humanity. <laughs> And you see things like Apocalypse, The Push, Sacrifice, where the, these people's lives are changed. From yeah, yeah. As a oh, well, thank of you. This. Well, that's those. Those are the. They'll be the things that I'm, you know, am and will be proud of. Is, uh, you know, television is a fairly um, fatuous occupation, but if you occasionally, you know, when when something happens in the real world that's helped that person, that is genuinely is a. Is a is a nice thing. And I don't do these shows so often that people are just being churned out on some kind of conveyor belt of some sort of makeover process. Right. I only do like one of these things a year. So it's, uh, and the, all these people have become friends, you know, I've stayed in touch with them and, and part of me wants to make sure that the, the work of the show continues, right. that they do actually, it isn't just a show that they did and they felt great for a bit and then they went back to where they were. So that's, that's important to me as well. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you. What, uh, what are you designing now? Broadway show you said was a show that you'd done before. Are you are you constantly designing new things or thinking of new illusions or new tricks that you can put in somewhere? So I am okay. So where am I now? So I'm I'm hoping for a Broadway show in the spring. Mm -hmm. So um, just waiting to hear on a theatre for that. So it could suddenly happen, and I might be out there in like April or um, or or not. It might be later in the year or, or not at all. Um, I'm starting a new book. I'm getting my head around a new book. So I wrote this book on happiness called, right, which called Happy. It'll which is, be linked to the show notes. Thank you. So that, yeah. that's available in America now, which is quite a new thing. And it's a lot of it's about stoicism and an approach to happiness. It's very different from the sort of normal self-help book approach. Um, so I'm starting to get my head around a second book around those sort of questions of, you know, what it is to flourish and, and uh, be human, uh, really. And, uh, and then I'm... Uh, I guess there'll be another TV thing. That'll, at the moment, there are three shows on Netflix. There's The Push, which is the guy getting pushed off the building story. Miracle, which is the stage show where I do the faith healing. And Sacrifice is the, is the new one. Um, and 
so I'll be working on a on a on a fourth. Um, that those are all projects for this year, uh, and then maybe even looking at sort of Europe. There are some other sort of countries that seem to. They've had my TV shows for a while, but I've never gone over there and performed. That'll be oh, that'll great. be fun. So, yeah, there's lots of fun things to explore. Broadway is the. I mean, that be that. Be, I enjoyed myself so much out there yeah. before. That would be that. I'm be shocked great. that hasn't happened yet. It seems so. I, I've gone to some Broadway shows that are nowhere near as interesting as watching something that you would do live. Oh, lovely. But, but I've also been really surprised at how long it's taken us to go, hey, this Darren Brown guy kind of knows what he's doing. Because I, I used to find these mm. things on YouTube 10 years ago or whatever, mm. maybe not even YouTube, maybe some other video site 10 years ago. And I was like, this is amazing. How is this not more popular? And oh. I would be sharing these things. And then I'd say, hey, have you heard of, you've heard of Darren Brown, right? And people go, Oh, I don't know. And I'm like, the guy in the Netflix. And then, of course, now I show people and they're like, whoa, this is inc yeah. incredible. I'm thinking, like, how long is it going to take for people to get it? Like, what, what, is, what is going on well, here? That's partly us. Well, we sort of held the shows back a bit from the States. So they, we sold them to around Europe. But we held back from the States because it meant that we could kind of do that properly at some mm. point and um, uh, in a more kind of, um, yeah, just in a more kind of, concerted effort and make it all happen part of a plan at some point i have no i never have any ambition or anything with these things at all so i leave that to the grown-ups that mm -hmm. sort of you know plan my career like that i just i just like to do what what's enjoyable and or feels worthwhile at the time but but that's why it just we actually held it back and in the last few years we've sort of gone right let's um start doing some stuff so that's why it's slowly now well that's to, exciting uh, yeah that's exciting. I mean, because you, you're a, essentially a household name in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, but yeah, certainly, oh. certainly no one knows me in the in the states. Yeah, Apart from you, you and yeah. Jen, and Jen, and yeah. and now a lot of other people as well. So hi. Yes. Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. Likewise. Thank you, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, and thanks, Jen. <laughs>